Thanks for the introduction. Really quickly, my talk doesn't have anything too graphic, any graphic images, but it is, again, a heavy topic, so please don't hesitate to get up and leave if you feel like that would be healthier for you. Um, so mental health disorders are a leading cause of disability and death worldwide. Approximately 18% of U.S. adults experience a mental health disorder in a given year, and almost half of us will develop at least one mental health condition in our lives. Psychotherapy is often very effective for many disorders, and it can help people learn to manage their mental illnesses. Unfortunately, one in five people in outpatient psychotherapy treat, qu quit treatment prematurely. And one potential answer to this lack of engagement with therapy is technology-delivered treatments, which can reduce barriers to pursuing therapy and increase engagement. Prior systems that support relatively low-risk individuals with single disorders show a lot of promise, but research into technology to support people with higher clinical complexity or those at risk for suicide who meet the criteria for multiple disorders remains a bit more limited. And a commonly used psychotherapy for people with high clinical complexity is called dialectical behavioral therapy, or DBT. DBT is similar to cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, but DBT puts a greater emphasis on social and emotional skills. DBT was developed by Dr. Marcia Linehan to help people with complex, difficult-to-treat disorders and suicidal ideation. Although it was originally designed to help people with borderline personality disorder, it's also been successfully applied to addictive behavior, eating disorders, and mood disorders. These advantages make DBT a good choice for a technology-delivered treatment to support people with high clinical complexity. We therefore developed Pocket Skills, a multimedia mobile web app designed to offer holistic support of DBT, including goal setting, educational components, skill practice, and self-tracking of positive and negative moods and behavior. We also contribute findings from a four-week field study with 73 people. After the study, participants reported decreased depression and anxiety and increased DBT skills use. Based on our qualitative analysis, we developed a model describing how Pocket Skills supports DBT and present design implications based on these findings. I'm first going to discuss the design of Pocket Skills. DBT is a skills based treatment. It contains modules designed to support people in developing concrete coping skills to help them solve problems, maintain relationships, and navigate negative events and emotions. DBT skills are traditionally learned during individual or group therapy and practiced independently using worksheets like you see here. But one of our main goals for pocket skills was for it to be as engaging as possible to encourage more consistent use. Inspired by prior work, we decided on a conversational UI. Instead of passively completing worksheets, pocket skills actively engages people in a simulated conversation as they learn material and practice skills. Prior work on such agents has involved things like sensing and responding to affect or using NLP to intelligently reply to input, but our agent is interesting in how rudimentary she is. She's completely scripted with some branching based on what people select, but our participants still discussed finding the technology more engaging and enjoyable because of her. And one of the reasons people seem to find the agent compelling is because she's based on Dr. Linehan, the creator of DBT. Our pilot study revealed that Dr. Linehan is so well known and trusted in the DBT community that basing the agent on her fosters trust in the content and engagement with the material. Our field study reiterated this point. People said things like, knowing that Marcia was involved, I knew this was a legit product. And having Marcia Linehan present information was a game changer. In addition, as Pocket Skills is based on Dr. Linehan's content and includes videos narrated by her, Emersha allows a sense of continuity. Instead of being a hodgepodge of media, the app feels like a single entity helping someone learn and practice their skills, which we hoped would also encourage engagement. When people open Pocket Skills, they see this homepage or hub, which displays the supported DBT modules. The basic section introduces people to DBT and helps them set their overall DBT goals, which may include things like increasing coping skills, friendships, and positive emotions and behaviors, and decreasing suicidal ideation, self-harm addictions, and other negative emotions and behaviors. 
The mindfulness module contains skills to teach people to be more accepting and less judgmental and stressed. The emotional regulation module helps people better understand and control their emotions. Distress tolerance skills give people specific healthy alternatives to unhealthy behaviors. So for example, instead of self-harming, someone could take a cold shower or gently snap a rubber band on their wrist. And the addiction skills module was specifically designed to help people overcome addictions. Within each module is an introduction to that module and all the skills related to it. Module introductions teach people the principles of the module and help them spe set module specific goals. For example, someone using emotional regulation may have the goal of better understanding their, their emotions. Finally, the skills practice sections help people learn and practice their module related skills. For example, someone feeling emotionally distressed may want to check the facts of the situation to verify that their emotional response is appropriate given the actual events. Once we had designed and implemented pocket skills, we wanted to see if it could help support therapies, so we conducted a four-week field study examining the feasibility of pocket skills. We recruited 73 participants from a DBT list solve. The vast majority of the participants were female, which perhaps reflects the fact that women are two to three times more likely to be diagnosed with mood disorders and borderline personality disorder and to seek therapy in general. All participants were actively enrolled in therapy. The most common diagnosed disorder was depression, followed by anxiety and borderline personality disorder. Participants completed surveys consisting of validated scales so we could assess their progress, including the PHQ-9, which measures depression, the OASIS, which measures anxiety, and the DBT Ways of Coping Checklist, which measures positive and negative coping skills use. They took the PHQ-9 and the OASIS weekly and the DBT Ways of Coping Checklist at the intake and exit surveys. The exit survey also consisted of pocket skills specific questions, which were predominantly open-ended questions asking about what people liked and disliked about pocket skills and whether and how it helped them. We had no app usage requirements, but we did send daily text messages to remind participants to engage with the app. I'm first going to talk about the most important results from the scales participants took throughout the study. We fully described the statistics in the paper, but we used hierarchical linear modeling to analyze the data. To visualize the results, we put the average scale score on the y-axis and the week the survey was taken on the x-axis. We also indicate the clinically significant thresholds for the scales, so for these lower numbers indicate less severe symptoms. We found that participants significantly improved on average on both the PHQ-9 and the OASIS. The rate of improvement did decrease, but participants continued to improve throughout the study. In fact, average scores indicated moderate depression and anxiety disorder before the study, and mild depression and no anxiety disorder after the study. We also graphed the changes in the DBT Ways of Coping Checklist subscales between the intake and exit surveys. For these scales, higher numbers indicate more frequent use of that type of coping mechanism. We found an increase in DVT skills use, which indicates that people started using positive skills more often. We also found a decrease in general dysfunctional coping and coping by blaming others, indicating that people started using these negative coping mechanisms less frequently. Finally, we calculated the clinically significant results. These are the results the clinical psychologist on our team was most interested in, as they indicate more than just statistical significance. People are considered improved if they exhibit positive change better than statistical chance and recovered if they additionally reach a clinically meaningful threshold. As you can see, we had participants who recovered and improved in all scales between the intake and exit surveys, which is better than we expected given that it was such a short study. We also conducted an open coding exercise of the participant responses to the free answer or exit survey questions to identify emergent themes. We used methods from grounded theory to develop a model of how participants felt pocket skills supported their DBT. Our model illustrates that pocket skills helped people engage with their DBT and learn and practice skills in their environmental context, which enabled them to implement their skills in their daily lives and see the results of using these skills. This helped them increase their self-efficacy and feel more capable of using skills in the future. 
The paper discusses the full model, but I'm going to focus on this cycle today, how implementing skills helps people see concrete results, increase their self-efficacy, and in turn feel more capable of implementing skills. So for successful DBT requires people to not just learn and practice skills, but to also implement them in their lives when they need them, instead of choosing a negative coping mechanism. Participants reported that pocket skills helped them bridge this gap between practicing and implementation. One participant explained, I don't just learn the skills, but pocket skills helps remind me what the skill is and how to use it step by step to apply it on a daily basis so it becomes a part of me. So this participant felt that pocket skills helped her better incorporate her DBT skills in her life. And one of the reasons participants reported pocket skills helped with implementation was its availability. As people could access pocket skills whenever they had their phone and an internet connection, they were able to use it on the go and in the context of their lives whenever they needed it. People felt this availability helped them remember their positive coping skills when they might have otherwise forgotten them. One participant said, the app allows you to practice in the moment, every day, any skill, and have quick access right at your fingertips, since you always have a phone, but don't always have a worksheet, say. So it decreases the barriers and burden of practicing. Because availability was so essential to skills implementation, an important design implication of our findings is the need for tools designed to support mental health to include these mobile components so people can use them in the moment they need them. As a result of implementing their DBT skills, participants reported actually seeing concrete results. In addition to the quantitative results I presented, participants described reduced distress, more positive relationships, and behavioral changes. For example, one participant said, when I actively used distress tolerance skills, I was able to reduce my SUDS, or subjective units of distress scale, score. So after using these skills, she was able to see this concrete improvement in her distress. And this brings up another important design implication, which is helping people see and understand the results of engaging with therapy. Pocket Skills does not administer the said scale. This participant knew to take an interpret that on her own, likely with the guidance of her therapist. Although she knew to do so, many people might not know how to determine whether DBT is helping them improve in concrete ways. Pocket skills includes ways to track positive and negative emotions and behaviors, but it does not support reflecting on one's progress. Incorporating visualizations or indications of progress could help people see results they might not have noticed otherwise. And one of the reasons that helping people see these results could be so useful is participants reported an increase in self-efficacy after seeing how DBT skills could help them. One participant explained, pocket skills gave me increased independence. I used it during moments of distress when I might otherwise have called someone for help. Phoning friends, family, or doctors often leaves me feeling embarrassed after I've calmed down. It is rewarding to feel like I can make it through intense moments with a little more independence, and pocket skills was helpful with that. So because she knew that pocket skills could help her cope more positively in upsetting situations, this participant ended up feeling more capable of independently managing her distress. And I wanted to bring up one final design consideration that this previous quote uncovered in discussing talking to friends, family, and doctors. Pocket skills currently only considers a single individual using the app to support their own DBT, but DBT includes more than just the person pursuing it. It's a process that often incorporates individual therapy, group sessions, and support from family and friends. Future work should examine the needs of these other people involved in DBT, particularly the therapists. We actually had a participant's therapist reach out to us and say that she discussed pocket skills in her group therapy sessions. She told us that pocket skills was very helpful in stimulating great discussions about mindfulness. So even though pocket skills isn't currently designed for use in group therapy, the therapist found it helpful to use in her group. By explicitly acknowledging different use cases, such as enabling group therapy discussions of what people learned and practiced using pocket skills throughout the week, we could better support the myriad ways in which people engage with DBT. Finally, participants mentioned that increased self-efficacy helped them feel more comfortable implementing DBT skills in the future. One participant commented, I think I would feel less confident in my ability to use DBT skills now if it weren't for pocket skills. 
We hope that over a longer period of use, pocket skills could help people continue to reinforce the cycle of implementing skills, seeing concrete results, and increasing their self-efficacy to manage their mental illness. So to summarize, as I've discussed, we found that participants reported significant improvements in anxiety, depression, and coping skills using pocket skills. We developed a model based on the qualitative results of how pocket skills was able to support DBT and contributed design recommendations based on these findings, including the importance of supporting availability, visualizing the results of engaging with DBT, and considering therapist needs. I'd like to thank my collaborators, Chelsea Wilkes, the team's clinical psychologist, Kale Rowan, our Toro Toledo, and Anne Paradiso, our designers and developers, Gloria Merck, who helped with data analysis, Marcia Linehan, the developer of DBT, and Mary Schorwinski for her overall mentorship and leadership throughout the project. Thank you, and I'll now take questions. Hi, uh, Jakob Bartram from the Technical University in Denmark. Uh, so this is super nice. I really like this. Uh, congratulations on this. Um, so I was just wondering about the recruitment. Yes. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? So, you know, how you recruited and were the, what were the sort of inclusion criteria and so on and so forth? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so Chelsea Wilkes is actually Marcia Linehan's student um, and so she's very involved in DBT and is familiar with this DBT list of which went out to both people who are enrolled in DBT and therapists who practice DBT. So um, we sent an email to this list of um, asking people to contact us if they were interested. Uh, we had both people interested in using the app and therapists interested in having their clients use the app. Um, and inclusion criteria, they had to have a mobile phone with data. Um, they had to be actively enrolled in therapy. Um, the, I think that was about it. Okay, so no, no requirements for PHQs? Sort of no. Impressive, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I think this is fantastic. Steve Whitaker, UCSC. <laughs> so um, the only thing I would want to just ask you about is, um, if you go back one slide, is, is just possible, did you see in the terms of uh, the visualizing results, for example, um, or, or even uh, your regime, do you see any kind of ironic effects, right? So, you, you, so the notion that if people are overly focused on, uh, let's say, improving mood, then mm. the failure to do that uh, can actually lead to a negative spiral. That's interesting. No, we didn't see any of that, um, but we didn't particularly look um, from the qualitative results I didn't see anything about people s saying anything like that, but we'd have to go back and look at the data. Yeah, more because the, there's the, uh, this is the kind of risk that you run into when you start doing uh, externalizations and you start having, uh, you know, m maybe more explicit success metrics. It's, yeah. So just, but I, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Jordan Pollock from Carleton. Uh, I was just wondering if you had, uh, and maybe I missed this, but some sort of control group for people who are in therapy that did not use your app? No, we did not. Right now, it's just a feasibility study. We definitely okay. want in future work for um, a more rigorous kind of RCT where we d would have a control group to see, um, to look at that. Okay, great, thank you.